Hello out there. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another live stream here from AutoCrypt. My name is Daniel. I'm one of the writing coaches, instructors, editors. I do a little bit of everything around here. And AutoCrypt does a little bit of everything for you as a writer. We have our fully functional writer's desk, which allows you to plan and write and edit your uh, book. Uh, and you can compare yourself against very famous authors. There's automated tools, so many things in there. We have the community uh, with uh, other writers such as yourself that talk about writing techniques and habits and share all kinds of fun things. And then, of course, we have our academy side, which, similar to um, this live stream, helps you learn more about the craft of writing. So today, I thought it would be fun to talk about writing the fantastic. In other words, uh, incorporating fantastical fantasy sort of elements, those sort of things in your work. Now, you may not specifically write fantasy, the genre. And if you do, or if you don't, uh, it's okay. You can stay tuned because you will still find this interesting. And because often we do include paranormal, supernatural, extra elements to our stories, even if we are not writing true fantasy. Some people might call this like soft fantasy or something like that. Fair enough. Um, but this, these sort of elements are in all different sort of works. Uh, there are also a lot of the building blocks I'm going to talk about form into other genres such as historical fantasy or sci-fi or other things as well. And you learn a lot about Daniel. Uh-oh. Um, I don't know about that. <laughs> Hopefully not too much. All right. So we're just going to go through some of these tips about writing the fantastical, just kind of fast and furious. And certainly I hope uh, those of you out there in uh, the comments in the chat can in uh, give you your comments as well. Let's begin with the concept of creating a baseline. And what I mean by that is if we're going to start layering in a lot of unbelievable things, we need to begin with a little bit of believability. In fact, a lot of believability. Uh, we're, it's going to be the currency that's going to give us the trust of the audience that when we incorporate some of these, you could say, sillier things or bizarre things, uh, there's a believability to it because we've already established that we're a trustworthy author and there's a grounding to this world. There's a grounding to these characters. It makes sense. It's relatable, all of these things. <laughs> did I buy Jeep chocolate after Easter too? Perhaps, perhaps I did. Perhaps I did. I'm a fan of the Jeep chocolate. <laughs> um, one thing that you want to avoid when you are incorporating the fantastic is what I call cheating your readers. And what I mean by that is when you start a work, you're creating a relationship with your uh, readers. You're creating a expectation. You are giving them um, you're giving them promises because you're saying, you know, this is the sort of story it is. This is sort of world it inhabits. This is the sort of work it is. This is maybe the genre. So even when you incorporate fantastical elements, what you don't want to do is all of a sudden pivot what was, you know, a hard boiled crime detective story into some sort of magical fantasy portal uh, story without really setting that up for the readers. If you do that, if you kind of do that sort of genre twist, it's a very tricky thing to do well and usually doesn't end well because what you've kind of done is cheated your readers. Uh, you have stolen their time because a lot of people maybe wouldn't have started the work had they known that's where they were going to go because that's not what they wanted. So if you do... If you do anticipate including some elements of the fantastical in your work, you do need to lean in fairly early that there is a possibility of some sort of fantastical element. Now, it, it really kind of depends on the level of the fantastical, right? Because there's levels of fantastical where within the story world itself, it's not necessarily fully accepted. This is stuff like, you know, maybe you have a, you could have a hard nosed, uh, boiled detective story and Bigfoot is in it, right? And big cryptozoology, right? And you can say, well, people in the story debate whether or not Bigfoot in fact actually exists. And maybe there's a part of the story which makes it seem like Bigfoot does in fact exist, but 
the audience is still left with enough wiggle room that they could maybe say he doesn't exist. Something like that is not such a genre pivot that usually causes this sort of reaction. What would cause that sort of reaction is if all of a sudden the hard-nosed detective got picked up by a Bigfoot and led to some Bigfoot commune, kind of like that old uh, short of the snowman, right? With all the snowman people and everything. Like if it started to become like the teddy bears picnic with Bigfoot and the, like all of a sudden, well, it's like you pivoted in multiple ways, right? You probably pivot in terms of the tone, but you've also pivoted in terms of the audience expectation. They were reading this crime thriller that was set in a very grounded real world scenario. And then you're kind of bailing everybody out with this weird outlandish thing. That's generally not going to go well. Everyone should join Outgrid to protect Daniel from us. We tease him relentlessly. I love it, though. It's such a great community. Nothing but love. Now, before you add the fantastical, one thing is keep in mind is use all you have. Now, this is true really no matter what. This actually comes from Brandon Sanderson's Laws of Magic, specifically written for people who are writing about magic, right? But one thing to keep in mind is you don't necessarily have to immediately jump to something fantastical if you have something else that could do the job just as well, right? Because then it begs the question, why are you doing it in a fantastical way versus a you might call mundane way, but it might not be mundane. It could be an unusual use of something you've already set up, right? You could have an unorthodox use of a tool, um, and, and that could be fun and creative in a way that's still not fantastical. Now, if you're going to go fantastical, uh, it should there should be a reason for it, right? Especially if this is in a world that's just about having fun with fantastical things. Um, but even if it is, don't add more fantastical things until you use everything that you've previously set up. Again, you just don't want a lot of redundancies. The more you add, the more contrived things tend to be. It's a bit of a house of cards, right? And it's it's hard to keep that stability. The more elements you place in the story, the more of a chance you have of something going off, of it being off balance, or the believability going away, et cetera, et cetera. I do love mysteries where you don't know at the end if the supernatural is real. Yes, I love that genre too. I'm a huge fan of the genre where there is the fan, it's a question and it and it has its foot really in the real world about, you know, how much of the real world is paranormal. And that's of course a question that a lot of people ask of all different kinds of persuasions. It's not something that necessitates some sort of childish imagination to ask that question, right? It's very it's quite a profound question, really, you know, how much is unexplained, how much might be who knows what, right? All right. And, you know, that's the basis of religious thought and, and so many different things. Profound questions. All right. Avoid purple. It's very easy when as soon as you introduce something unexpected and fantastical or different that you're going to start waxing poetic about it because isn't it so wonderful and mysterious and beautiful? And yes, that's fine to a certain extent. Uh, but do be careful about how far you go into this, right? Now, when we talk about purple prose, we have a video about purple prose. If you haven't seen it, check out it on the channel. It's really good if I do say so myself. But purple prose, not, not that I mind purple. I actually like purple. Uh, purple was often worn as a, a shade that was hard to obtain back in the day. So it was a way to um, show off your wealth. You can see that in a lot of ancient writings. Um, and uh, so purple prose, the idea is that you're overdoing it. You're just trying to brag about your writing skill versus actually just talk to the subject at hand. And it's very easy to go into the sort of overly artistic, you know, the, they call it the talking to a fruit Shakespearean acting, you know, where it's just way over the top because you're like, well, this is an over the top moment. So I'm just going to go over the top with it. And like I said, there's a certain allowance for it, but do be careful because if you're trying to keep it believable, the last thing you want to do is lose the believability, not because what you're doing is so contrived, but because you're writing about it in such a contrived way, right? If you completely change your style and you get all poetic and everything, well, it's going to stand out all the more and people will be less likely to accept it within the story. So keep that in mind. Uh, use sensory language, though. So what I'm saying is not don't be descriptive. We do want to tell or um, not tell we do want to show and not tell strike that reverse it as one wants to say you do want to show and not tell you want to demonstrate 
the reaction of the characters. In fact, one of the best ways to make something believable is by talking about the reaction of the characters to it, because we care about the characters already. We've built it to, we've built a relationship with them. And so seeing how something amazing or different or unusual can affect the characters uh, can make us buy into it all the more. In terms of, uh, you know, it's kind of like how somebody you really love could perhaps make you like something you don't generally like. You might find is maybe a contrived thing to do. You're like, well, I don't know, but you'd want to do that. And they'll start talking about it in an excited way. And you're like, oh, okay, I can see it now. It makes sense, you know. So what it does is it can ground it, for sure. For marriage proposals, some purple is okay. Well, it wouldn't have been with my wife, I can tell you that. She is harsh, harsh, harsh about that. We um, we used to joke around with like those Hallmark cards, you know, with the drippy romantic language. What I would do is I would get it, and then inside would be some incredibly like <laughs> direct and uh, some might find vulgar message. But that's that was just our sense of humor because the outside is so drippy and silly to us. So yeah, no, it's not around my house. <laughs> doesn't work well even when we're trying to be romantic it just tends to backfire we should start laughing at each other all right but explore different reactions and i'm not saying uh, this is not relationship advice so you know uh, <laughs> it, uh don't necessarily try that at home uh it depends on your spouse or your significant other <laughs> um explore different reactions yes my wife is is very very cool um and as much as a literary snob as i am um, everybody in your story who's interacting with this uh, fantastical element should, in fact, have a different reaction to it. It's a great way of showing it, even if it's a nuanced one, right? Some people will be more fearful of it. Some people might be more disbelieved or skeptical. Some people might be more accepting, et cetera, et cetera. One of the great reasons to incorporate fantastical elements into a story that's generally uh, grounded story is to do just this. It's to show the audience what happens when these characters are facing something that they cannot fully explain. How do they react? Because that's a that's kind of a basic human test, right? Um, it's like uh, on the Amazing Race, you know, they have the relationship test, as it were, because you go with your significant other and you find out how you can cope with different things. And one of the things is is um, you know what do you do with the unexpected. That, that something that kind of breaks the rules of what you would think is normal. And uh, yeah, people are going to have different reactions. Some people are much more flexible than others. And, and, you know, and what? Some people are much more likely to be in disbelief. Reactions to prose may vary from household to household. Yes, and author to author. When I'm talking about avoiding purple prose or being careful with it, it's specifically in relationship to the rest of your work. Right? If you have a style that's quite lyrical, quite poetic, that's your style. That's great. So when you talk about the fantastical, you can still talk that way. But if your normal style is kind of this baseline, you know, more hidden or um, what you want to say, transparent narrator, right? It's not too intrusive. It's not too poetic in itself. And then all of a sudden you become a completely different author when you start talking about the fantastical. That's really what I'm talking about as a problem. All right. So yes, explore different reactions among your characters. Foreshadowing helps as well. And this is where I was saying you don't want to cheat your audience. You don't have to give it all away. Like, let's imagine that there is a bit of a twist, right? That something that you wouldn't necessarily assume is fantastic but turns out to be fantastical. I would say if you don't want to give that specific point away, what you might want to do is at least hint to somebody's belief in something supernatural similar to it, um, something in the language to indicate something like that. You don't have to telegraph what's going to happen in the story, but you do need to set up kind of a tonal expectation that something like that could occur. Now, you always have to do this? Not necessarily. You know, there are authors who have gotten away with it. You know, a classic example I talk about is Christopher Nolan's The Prestige has a major plot twist in it, which really changes the genre of the story. And I've heard from, I think most people are cool with it, but they think it's interesting and intriguing. And there are certain people that are upset by it and think it's a cheat. So it's a bit of a risk, but you can, in fact, do it. You're comparing purple prose to truffle oil from now on. It's not that it has a bad flavor. It should just be used very carefully. Interesting. Kind of like that. 
it kind of goes with the same kind of richness to it, right? Now, don't under underestimate the cool factor. The cooler something is, the more you can get away with it, right? And the challenge is, is what is cool to your audience. This, again, is why audience expectation matters. If somebody who doesn't generally write, read fantasy picks up a, a, you know, a thriller, and all of a sudden a dragon shows up at the end, well, they're not going to think that's cool. They're going to think that's childish and silly because that's not what they tend to read. But if you do attract the people that think dragons are really cool and awesome, then sure, why not, right? And you could start the story where maybe dragons are not, in fact, real. They're talked about or something like that. I think you have something kind of like uh, the film Unbreakable, uh, which deals with kind of a real-life comic book scenario. But it sets up from the beginning that, you know, this is going to be a comic book story and this is going to be kind of an unpacking of the comic book myth in general. And then it's going to start week in the fantastical moments. So it doesn't really come from out of the blue. And of course, it starts with a big mystery of how somebody could have survived an accident. And so um, I think that works really well. And it's different than, um, you know, something like The Avengers, right? There is a tonal difference to that story. There's a difference that the audience uh, asks in terms of what you have to believe that's fantastical, et cetera, et cetera. It is different. And uh, yeah. Uh, the kind of people that might like something like Unbreakable might not want to like something like The Avengers because they might not want to have that much unbelievability in their story, right? They may be distracted by it, or again, might find it childish, et cetera, et cetera. And so you do have to factor what is cool to your audience. But whatever is cool to your audience, you're going to be able to get away with, right? And don't underestimate that. Feel free to lean into that audience and give them what they want, which is cool stuff. Um, avoiding cliches can help as well. This kind of goes with the purple prose bit, but specifically, yeah, and how you write about it, you know, try to be careful, uh, because it will make it feel less like you just kind of pulled clip art from the internet and just kind of slapped it in your book. Cause that's what you want to avoid. You don't want it to be like, oh, well, they just ran out of ideas. So they decided this book would be way cooler if it had aliens in it. It's like, well, you don't want to do that, right? You want it to feel earned. You want it to feel natural. And so avoiding cliches kind of help with that. And then also avoid cliches in how you present the material. Again, um, in, in terms of what the material is, right? So if you have a very grounded, believable world, and then you introduce aliens, well, maybe instead of some of the stereotypical kind of fun things you might do with aliens that are a little bit more unbelievable, maybe they take on a more believable uh, characteristic, right? A little bit less well, I wouldn't say it's believable, but less fantastic, less unusual, less beyond the norm, right? It's a little bit closer to something that you think would make sense. So perhaps their technology level is not crazy outlandish. Uh, perhaps the way they interact with humans is not crazy outlandish, et cetera, et cetera. Humor often can mask the ridiculous. This is something to keep in mind as well. It can be tricky. Because you can't exactly do the ha ha, isn't that funny? How weird, quirky, isn't it? Like, you can't quite do that. But what you can do is you can certainly have characters make jokes about it or have comedic reactions to things, uh, which can help mask how silly it is because essentially you're kind of acknowledging how silly it is as well. So um, if you do end up, and this is something where even when you have fantastical elements in a story where the audience is asked to believe a lot, it still can help. So like things like when you have Loki in the Avengers and uh, Tony Stark calls him Shakespeare in the park, it's like, yeah, he's wearing a really ridiculous outfit. Now, what's the ridiculous outfit in a movie that has a Norse god and a super... Um, uh, a super person in, in this robotic armor and somebody who took super syrup and, and became big and become this massive three months. Like, how is that ridiculous? But it still is kind of ridiculous costume-wise. So pointing that out actually does in fact around the story a bit more and makes it a bit more believable because it's like, yeah, you can't, yeah, this is a little silly, isn't it? So this is something to keep in mind, right? If you have something that you think some people might think in a kind of a goofy way, if a character acknowledges that it's kind of goofy, uh, it can help because it helps the audience be like, oh, okay, the author isn't treating me. It's kind of like respect for the audience, right? It's like the, audience, the author is not really just expecting I'm going to buy this. 
sense. The author knows that it's a little silly and it just makes it easier to go down. Spoonful of sugar, right? I guess. Um, and that gets to what it's called hanging a lantern, right? Hanging a lantern is a concept writers talk about, about pointing out to the audience something that is contrived. This again is a risky thing to do because it can be a cheap way of, of doing it, right? Um, because like you could have, you know, the end of the story, somebody gets a check and it's like, you didn't realize this, but your great uncle is the king, is from the kingdom, of blah, blah, blah. And now you have a billion dollars. You're like, wow, that's weird. What a weird coincidence, wink, wink. And no, is that wink, wink going to make that not feel like a cop-out ending? Probably not, right? <laughs> like you might, you might at least appreciate that the author is realizing how silly this all is, but probably not. But hanging a lantern on things like, wow, that's a weird coincidence or, you know, how strange. I didn't think that was possible. Yes, that's good. What you don't want is for something weird, unusual to land in your story and everybody acts like it's like another day, you know, another day in the park because that's weird uh, and stuff like that. Is there a much more non-cliche way of saying hang lantern that phrase feels so overused? Perhaps, but it's one of those, I wouldn't call it a cliche, it's more of a jargon. You know, it's a term. It's just, it's like Joe don't tell, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, another way of saying would be um, highlighting your contrivance, I guess would be another way of saying it, you know. Highlighting your contrivance is a way for the audience to realize you're, you're aware of the contrivance. You're asking them to play along. You're kind of nudging them, doing a little wink to them. But again, it's still not excusing the fact that it's a contrivance. It's more just like, yeah, I know it's contrived, but can we go with it? Um, and so it's a risky thing to do. Is it like foreshadowing? No, no, it generally happens as it's happening, not before. Uh, foreshadowing is a way to set up, to try to make it feel less contrived. Uh, this is, you you know, it, it it is something that somebody could legitimately say is contrived, and so therefore you're saying, wow, isn't this contrived? Isn't this fascinating? And then you move on. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit, a little bit of a risky thing. Some people call it like meta to do that as well. <laughs> it feels like one is trying too hard when using it. Yeah, I mean, jargonal terms could be like that. I understand. Editing something where the characters are making jokes about another character and constantly dropping by hiding and jumping out of trees, and you had to be able to twice and lean into it. Right. Um, things like that, like things that the audience might notice are weird habits the characters have. Like uh, J.K. Rowling did this with Harry Potter in the fifth book, because um, Hermione points out it's like Harry you kind of the seating thing where you just like run into burning buildings without thinking about it because at some point somebody would tell him that in real life right and so that's another level so that's I do like uh hang level lands a little bit better than highlighting contrivances because it's not always really a contrivance it's more of a potential flaw or error that an audience member might spot and you're kind of catching it and getting ahead of them yeah, shining the light on something. Exactly. Instead of, it's basically the opposite of hiding it. Instead of playing like smoke and mirrors magician, which is another way of handling a contrivance, and be like, I've got to slip this under the radar. It doesn't, it's like Casa, Casablanca kind of does this with the, the papers that can't be um, refuted, which is kind of a weird contrived thing. And so they just kind of slip it in. They're like, oh, all right, you know, here's these papers of transit. Isn't that great? You know. <laughs> but uh, hanging a lantern on it would be like, wow, that's really weird. Why would they operate like that? And they're like, I know, isn't that strange? That would be more like hanging a lantern. <laughs> um, unexpected should rarely solve problems. You might have heard this from me before because I love to give this advice, but I just think it's worth saying. Unexpected fantastical elements that solve problems are going to be the hardest ones to pull off. Because what it feels like is you just contrived the way out of your problem rather than coming up with a good solution that you set up that is, you know, fitting with the story. It feels it feels contrived because it is, right? So what you don't want is a contrivance to solve your problem if you could at all avoid it. If a reader might not believe it, have the character struggle to believe it too. There you go. That's a way of looking at it. But I will say contrivances that create problems are not the same issue because we are pessimistic people. We generally believe that coincidence can go negatively. We just are not as apt to believe that coincidence goes well.
All right. Levels of acceptance. So to finish off our little tips here, I wanted to go through the levels of acceptance when it comes to the fantastical. This is very similar to the stages of grief. Now, now this is not like an exact psychological thing. It's not like everybody goes through the steps in every order or things like that. But it's a good way to communicate like how somebody engages with the fantastical so we can speak to that. Uh, but before I do that, I would like to point out the um, showing versus telling workshop. I've been talking about that rule a little bit during this session. If you haven't ever figured out what that rule exactly means, I highly recommend the course. Um, lots of people told me afterwards, they're like, I never really understood it before, and now I do. So that's exactly what we're trying to do with this. So you can sign up there for our showing versus telling workshop. It takes place on Thursday and Sunday. Um, and uh, it is a good time, good times for sure. Also, we have coming up, I just want to put a shout out for our short story lab that's going to be starting very soon in just a few weeks here. And I have to put that, uh, I'll put the uh, link in the, uh, in the comments there uh, or the, uh, in the chat. Just a second here. Hold on. Where is my link here? I apologize. Uh, but the Short Story Lab is actually a partnership. Uh, we have also worked with, uh, it's going to be me, and then also we're using a lot of the writings and philosophy of Rain Hall, a fantastic short story author. We've had her on the live stream in the past, and so we'll be doing exercises and coursework uh, from her uh, methods of creating stories. So that's going to be a lot of fun as well. You registered. Awesome. Fantastic. I think they're going to be at the short story, at the showing versus telling. That's awesome. But yeah, the short story writing course starts in a few weeks and that will lead into, I'm going to do a little bit of a spoiler here, but uh, yeah, uh, we're going to be doing a short story writing challenge soon. So I'll just put that out. Like yay! But yes, it'll be it'll be uh, it's a lot of fun. It's our big event we do every year. Um, it is coming back. Bum bum bum. So it'd be a great course to take in preparation of that. Of course, we always have our fantasy writing club uh, on Tuesdays. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be reading bad fantasy, which is always fun. Um, yesterday, we read bad sci-fi, and that was a hoot. I like literally died laughing on one of them. It was something to behold. For those of you who are there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but yeah, we go to the depths of Amazon. I mean, a lot of it now is even written by AI, so it's kind of funny. And then tomorrow, uh, we'll have our horror club at 6 p.m. And Gareth will be doing some analysis of your writing. So if you're a pro member, you can get some uh, professional feedback. Check out the events calendar for that. And of course, we have our accountability club every Monday. So please, please, please join us for that if you want to increase your productivity. We have great success stories from people who join us on a weekly basis. And uh, yeah, we're doing great things. Quite fantastic. It's true. Daryl is now a zombie. I mean, would you know the difference? I don't even know what that means, but it sounded fun. All right. Let's talk again about levels of acceptance. Maybe you need to do those levels of acceptance to me. Um, fair enough. Um, but yes, it's very similar to uh, the stages of grief is kind of the way I like to frame it because that's just a nice way of thinking about a major change in somebody's life. Okay, So the first stage would be denial, much like grief, right? Um, the first stage for something unbelievably fantastical tends to be, well, that's not really what I think it is, right? Even if it's a smidge of denial, there might be, might be so you know, obnoxiously presented to the person that they really can't deny its existence. Uh, but often, you know, uh, they'll deny it, right? They'll be like, I don't know, am I hallucinating? Did I have any drugs? Like, whatever it is, right? So that would be a first step for most people, right? And then you have anger. Now, you might be like, well, why would they be angry? Well, the thing is, is that unexpected things just does tend to make us angry because it means that the world is not that observable or predictable. We don't generally like things being that unpredictable. Would we like a life that's completely predictable? No, that would be boring, right? But we don't want it to be so outlandishly unpredictable that something super fantastical can happen. Let's be honest. 
because what that means is it calls into question our beliefs about on the study. So yes, there's a little bit of anger from the ignorance, from the acknowledgement of the ignorance, and then also the acknowledgement of the lack of control we have over our life. Lots of reasons why you're going to have an angry sort of response to something fantastic. And then you'll have the predicting. Oh, this is a good question. Is this the level of acceptance of the reader or the character? I'm specifically speaking of the character in the story. But yes, a reader would go through a similar sort of experience, which is why when you can traumatize it with a character, it really leads the reader along, right? Because they're experiencing much the same thing. So it's great. It really does work on both levels. But yes, yeah, so next level you kind of do is that predicting. Like, okay, so therefore, I'm trying to get my footing and you kind of test and you see, uh, you know, this would be like the bargaining stage in grief. This is like, okay, so therefore, because the world now works like this, kind of like this, and I don't know, and maybe, and, and you're kind of figuring out the rules and whatnot and navigating that. Then you have the kind of weight of all of this. Now that you fully understand the gravity of everything, you're kind of stupefied because you, again, this assuming this is a fantastical thing you never would have expected, right? Or uh, is beyond the realm of normal. So now that you've gone through the, I didn't believe it, okay, I'm angry that this could even be something I have to wrestle with it, and now I'm wrestling with it, now you're like, the weight of all of that kind of hits you, and you're stunned, and you're like, okay, this is, this is it. This is where, this is why you have the character be like, oh, so this is a thing now, right? That's kind of that moment, right? It's a stun sort of, okay, sure. Um, which is not quite the same thing as what we're going to get to with this acceptance. It's really more of a, I don't know what to say at this point. And then you have acceptance. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, now that the whole weight of it hit me and I'm taking it all in and I'm like, and now I'm like, okay, so therefore let's move forward in a way that it doesn't traumatize me anymore. And do they ever have to get to this level? No, you don't have to take the characters all the way to acceptance. You don't have to take them all the way past denial, right? You have your, you can, you can decide, like, where is this? Again, it depends on the sort of story you're telling. If you're not doing a true fantasy, right, then uh, you could have a fantastical element that stays at that denial level. And that's the sort of story where people aren't sure if it's real or not, right? Now, there might be some characters within the story that are all the way to acceptance, right? But I'm saying maybe the main character isn't that. Maybe you're not expecting the audience to get all the way to get to acceptance as well. Now, this is also true if you write fantasy and there are fantastical elements in your fantasy. And you're like, that's not redundant. No, I mean, like, there's probably a baseline. This is an everyday occurrence within your fantasy world. And there might be things that seem fantastical even within that fantasy world, right? So, you know, think about something like, Lord of the Rings, right? There are elements of that that are mundane to them, but wouldn't be mundane to us. Some of the interesting species and the worlds and, and the environment, things like that. There's also other things that seem quite spectacular, even to the characters within the story, like the Balrog or something like that, right? So, yeah. Yes, I said they were suspiciously close. I said I was basing it on that. <laughs> I did not hide a ball. I hung a lantern on the fact that I was using the stages of grief for my for my stages of the for my stages of fantasy. Yeah, because I think it's a good I think it's a good starting point. You know, and again, is everybody going to do it on the same exact order? Does everybody go through all these steps? No, but this is a good way to frame it. Um, it's not a bad kind of baseline to start. Is the bargaining stage where we make deals with crossroad demons? It's like, what is it? Omamu, I've come to bargain, right? <laughs> All right. So anyway, those are methods of writing the fantastical. I certainly hope that uh, you found this helpful. Yes, stages of grief are basically taking something you don't want to believe and learning to believe it. Exactly. That's why I think of the same thing. It is something that you shouldn't that you, that you don't normally have that happen in your life that you really maybe wouldn't even want to have happen in your life and it's the same thing with fantastic elements for sure um so anyway yes that is our show for a uh, day i certainly hope to see you in things like the fantasy club or the horror club or joy versus telling or the short story there's always so much going on in autocrit and of course please like subscribe 
hit the bell if you'd like to see more videos like this. We'll continue to do more here. Um, we do have some really special events coming up. I don't know if I'm going to announce them quite today, but stay tuned to this channel because I will say we will have some special guests hitting this channel soon. Although I think it might be even live on this channel. So look around this channel. You'll see uh, in May we're, we're going to have some events. And we have some special guests coming that are going to be really fun to talk to. So pay attention to that. And I will see you around the Otter Creek community. Bye, everybody. You have a great week.